ใช All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, good morning for me from uh, San Francisco, and good afternoon, good evening, all around the world. Um, welcome to uh, Techtivation's Young Women's Climate AI Ecopreneurship Summit as part of Climate Week. My name is Bryant Gomer. I am the Senior Director of Volunteer Programs at Techtivation. Techtivation is a global uh, nonprofit that brings together the world's largest group of young women to tackle climate change using cutting edge technologies and entrepreneurship. We have a fantastic and jam packed event today. So I wanna move right into our first speaker who's gonna kick us off with an introduction to citizen AI ecopreneurship. And to do that, I'm thrilled uh, to have Gabriella Burian, who is an agriculture engineer with a master in sustainability. And since 2020, Gabriella has served as the global multi-stakeholder platform lead at Bayer, a global enterprise with core competencies in the life science fields of healthcare and agriculture. Sustainability is both a career path and a passion of Gabriella's, as she is also an advocate for getting more people involved in the sustainable development goals. Uh, Gabriella, thank you so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Technovation. It's a real pleasure and honor to call in from the Climate Week, in fact. Then when we start to think this week here has been very noisy, uh, a lot going on. However, the most important thing we haven't seen so much then very happy to see this here. That's exactly the power of education for girls in STEM. And the reason why is very simple, only two factors. Girls are very impacted and have not been engaged in finding solutions. And we wonder why we are where we are, not having the solutions that are necessary. Then when we think about next steps, uh, you can go to the next slide and you can navigate a little bit on some few factors that can help each one of us to better understand the role that we can play with this process. Thank you, Brian, if you can, or if you can change the slide. Thank you. And this is one that I love <laughs> because it's very simple, very direct. It's we all want, and we need, in fact, more than once to deliver sustainable development goals in seven years, not a lot of time. For those in agriculture, it's just seven harvests, seven decisions. And the way, there is only one way that can accelerate this, is exactly investing in girls, educating the girls, supporting and enabling the education of girls in technology, AI, and all the potential solutions that they can bring to the table. And of course, making sure they are part of this table too, making sure their voice are heard. Then this is why it's special for us to have girls at, in some minutes to talk with us about what this means for them. Thank you. Then with that being said, Having, having the challenge and then girls enabled to solve those challenges, we can uh, go ahead supporting key points that will make it happen. And uh, if you move to the next slide, we'll see what are those factors. Then here again, the sustainable development goals and uh, the linkage that we have with girls that are really the focus of the tech innovation. This is why I'm really very proud and very excited, in fact, to be part of this. And the good part is everyone, in fact, can part. You can be sponsor, you can be mentor, you can support. And if we go ahead to the next slide, we start to look more into the details of how this can be uh, happening. Uh, first of all, we need people across the world 
it's enough of uh, just this north deciding what the south will be doing. Then we really need a powerful system like Technovation has been building for 13 years. Then more than 30, and I needed the numbers here. What are the, uh, the reach out that's really impressive? It's 370,000 participants. I really need the number because it's uh, each time I step, it's need to stop to think. Then we are talking about fi almost 500,000 of participants during those 13 years, then it's about alumni and we will hear from them. And how about countries? More than 120 countries. Then very powerful, ensuring innovations are uh, adapted to each reality. Then nowadays we have 12,000 innovation solutions prepared, created by those girls enabled by tech innovation. And if we go one more slide, we'll go like it's what's next. Then what's next is reinforcing this power and this new cross cutting edge method that Technovation has been working with, enabling science data and connecting this with the SDGs as we all know in science has been showing many articles showing that we need exactly those kind of advancement uh, methodology to share and uh, to measure like KPIs related to SDGs. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Tech Innovation has been working to match exactly those new solutions with each one of the SDGs that we as society we need to advance. Then, next slide, please. And we are getting there. Then here you can see we have many impressive apps and I really encourage people to go and to see. But for now, we have a special invitation. The invitation is to hear from them uh, what they have been up to. And also the invitation is for each one to know more about tech innovation because the good news is uh, we can help support the main point that has been said here in the Climate Week and everywhere in fact, we need to get this done and each one of us are crucial. Then with that, I will hand over to you again and thank you all for the opportunity. We still have one more day of Climate Week, but a lot more to make it happen. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, over. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for kicking this off uh, with that great introduction. Um, let's move right along to our next discussion, which I'm really excited about. Um, we have a discussion on the topic of using low cost sensors in the field to support innovative climate enterprises, uh, like so many of our Tech Innovation Girls participants. Uh, leading this discussion, we have Jeff Herrick, a soil scientist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Jeff currently leads development of the Global Land Potential Knowledge System mobile app. And Jeff is joined by Laura Hamrick, a communications and research coordinator for LAND PKS, which I just mentioned. Uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Brian. And thanks, Gadiela. Um, that was a fantastic introduction. And I would just echo everything that uh, the Gadiela said, um, girls' education is at the heart of sustainable development. Um, women and girls have been a huge part of the development of this 15-year journey that we've been on now. Um, we came up with the idea 15 years ago um, at a conference um, in Mexico, actually, that had a huge number of, of young folks, um, young people involved. And, um, and we're just going to run through really quickly um, where we've gotten to and, and some of the maybe lessons learned. So um, this is a map of where the app is being used. It's the Land Potential Knowledge System. Um, it's a system that's used to learn about your soils, about your land, and also collect data and, and start to, to um, crowdsource some, some even better information so that we can make better decisions. So how do we design Land PKS? And I'm just gonna repeat this slide as I go through and talk about a couple of examples. First, we listen to what the potential users need. 
So we don't start with our idea. We actually start with their ideas and what it is that they need. And then second, determine if it's possible for an app to meet that need. Sometimes these needs are actually not things that technology can help with. And if they're not, then we shouldn't be trying to make technology work if we already know that it's probably not going to work. And then this third, which is related, is decide if an app is the best way to meet that need. And again, it may or may not. It, there may be other um, tools that we can use that are better than a mobile app or a piece of technology. And then watching and listening to the users to learn how to design the app, what tools they might be able to use with it. So the only tools um, that we require for the app are literally the phone itself, and it has a number of sensors embedded in, in all of our phones these days, um, and also tools that people might be able to find laying around any village anywhere in the world. So for example, a user need was identified as a rapid, simple way to monitor rangeland degradation. We know there's a lot of degradation of lands throughout the world. This happens to be in, um, in East Africa. And, um, and in, typically, in, we use tapes. We use these long 100-meter tapes to measure vegetation. And that's not something that's usually available, and it's kind of a pain to use. And we realized when we were um, working in East Africa that almost everybody who was in rangelands out working with livestock, the pastoralists, was carrying a meter stick. Not a meter stick like we used to measure, but a meter long stick. And we could turn that into a measuring tool. So we put five marks on this meter stick and we use it to measure the cover of the vegetation, the um, height of the vegetation, the density of the vegetation. So we use that one simple tool in a lot of different ways. Initially, we developed a paper data form that's all based on pictures. So that was the other thing is literacy is fairly low in the communities that we were working with. So we needed to make a data form that was in this case, all pictures. Um, with a few explanations and words, but actually you don't need those words to, to collect the data. We then converted that um, into a mobile app where those pictures are actually presented on the app itself. We've got a, a, um, a monitoring manual that was also translated into Swahili that goes along with that, but it's actually not necessary to use it. Next, the ability to determine the texture. Texture, as I, I think a lot of folks understand, is the sand and silt and clay content of the soil. The more sand you have, the faster water soaks in. The more clay you have, the slower it flo flo soaks in and the more likely we are to have flooding. And with land degradation and soil erosion, that in soils tends to increase the amount of clay. So we want to, we need to understand how much, what the texture is, and then whether or not the texture is changing over time, like if, if it's sandier at the top and it's clay, more clay down below, and then we have soil erosion, we're going to have a lot less infiltration and a lot more runoff and a lot more flooding, like we see here actually in southern New Mexico and some farmland in the United States. <laughs> so we developed this, this tool here, and I just want to um, you to listen for a second. And the woman here oh, no. is demonstrating the app. She's an extension worker. In Tanzania. And the man that was standing to the to the, her right uh, left of her in our in our photo actually has a, is a Tanzanian man with a PhD from the Land Use Planning Commission. And when we went out to do the training, the first time we ran through it with the farmers for the app, he led the training. The second time she pushed him out of the side and said, no, I'm gonna lead the training. And that was a good thing because she actually did a much better job than I would have done, did a better job than he had done. So she basically took that technology, took it over and, and, and started teaching it. Um, and again, for us, that was really good feedback. Um, so the next one is um, the land use planning agency is in Tanzania and Ethiopia wanted to use this system for, for land evaluation to determine the sustainable potential of their land. But they didn't have a way to do that very efficiently. They were doing it on paper and it wasn't very well guided. They weren't getting real good data. A lot of times people weren't doing it, even though it was part of the land use planning process. And so we then worked with them to add an additional function that would allow them to do this. We're building on, you need to know texture and slope 
and a lot of other things that were already in the apps. Another thing to look out for when you're developing an app, always be asking the questions, well, we developed it for one thing, but maybe it could be used for something else. Uh, and this is just an example of, of some of the screens we developed. Um, this is that same gentleman um, explaining um, how this how this works. So with that, I'm going to turn it over for the last um, wrap up to Laura um, to talk us through. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. So I just wanted to pull out some kind of big ideas from the examples that Jeff was just giving to kind of you know, focus on how, how would you go about designing a useful app that serves, you know, a local community as well as global needs. Uh, and so there's three questions that I pulled out from kind of the approach that Land PKS has taken, because I'm relatively new to the team. And so there's things that I'm noticing that are really unique about the approach and interesting about the approach Land PKS has taken. So I think the first question when you ask, what is the need that this app will serve? It's a twofold question. So the first part of that question is, what is the need of the individual user that you're meeting? Uh, so it could be like in the case of land PKS, you know, people want to know what kind of soil they're on. So they, if, if it's a smallholder farm, for example, they, they know better what um, tools or crops or things they might want to uh, grow on that land. Um, and so, oops, sorry, Jeff, I think it's, yeah, perfect, thanks. Um, and so basically that's serving that individual's need, right? So that's how pe why people are gonna actually wanna use the app. But the important thing we wanna do too is then say, can the data that we're, um, oh, sorry, Jeff, um, I think the screenshotting yeah. is showing up for Got us, it. sorry. <laughs> Thank you, I just messed up twice. That's all good. This is why Laura does the technology. <laughs> So you also want to look at is the data that we're collecting or the action that the user is taking going to serve some broader societal goal, like having an open source data platform uh, about soil data from around the world. So, um, you know, when you're designing, you want to think about are people going to use the app and then how can that data be used in a productive and useful way. The second takeaway that I think Lynn PKS has done a really good job of is thinking about the language and the images that are used in the app. Um, to make sure that it, it's usable by the people you want to use the app. So the biggest thing there is testing with actual users and listening to the words that they use when they talk about, uh, you know, if it's a farmer, listening to the words they use when they talk about their farm. Um, and of course, as Jeff mentioned, you know, literacy can vary quite widely. And so using images and words together is often a really good way of ensuring that everyone can access uh, your program. Um, and so I think with LAM PKS, there's an example of how, how they did this well when developing it, which is there's a question that says, you know, do you need to add lime to your soil? Now that question could have been, what is your soil pH? But instead they asked a question that, you know, farmers will be more likely to know the answer to and won't need to go run a test to know the answer. Uh, and you're getting similar data from those two different questions, but they're worded very differently. Uh, and then lastly, again, as Jeff has already mentioned, thinking really creatively about what tools uh, your users have access to in their daily lives, whether that's a smartphone or a phone that doesn't have smart capabilities or a meter long stick that they carry around, right? Thinking about how can we gather important um, data with, you know, without making people go out and buy something or have to go you know, get a particular type of technology. Uh, so trying to be creative about the, the tools at hand. So one example that Jeff didn't mention is there's a, a tool in the app to measure the color of soil. And typically, historically, this has been done with a printed booklet with color on it um, that you had to match it to, but we used a uh, the phone camera and then an algorithm with matching, you know, a color reference in the photo to make sure that we could do this with just a smartphone. So. I'll wrap up there, but just again, I uh, wanted to pull those three different big ideas out from the examples that Jeff gave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff and Laura. Um, that was great. And, and the benefit of recording this, this is that that conversation will be such a great tool and resource to look back on for, for our girls, for our participants, and for other girls kind of engaging with this content. So thank you very much. Um, so next, we're going to move on to a conversation um, with two Technovation alumni, 
um, that uh, our previous participants. This will be uh, moderated by my colleague Kate Young and participating we have Winnie Musamba and Gio, uh, Giovanna Romero Contreras. Um, Kate, I will pass it over to you for introductions and to get, kick off this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Bryant, and thank you, Jeff and Laura, for sharing about your really awesome work. Um, yeah, hi, so my name is Kate Young. I am the tech, um, Community Engagement Coordinator here at Technovation, and as part of this role, I get the privilege of meeting so many awesome alumni around the world, including our two next guests, Winnie and Giovanna. So I think um, I will just jump right in and let them introduce themselves. Let me put them up on screen. Um, Giovanna, do you want to start? Start us off? Sure. Well, uh, my name is Giovanna, and the problem I'm working on in my community is a lack of initiatives that address climate change with a gender perspective. Since although there are many groups that work on ecology and sustainability issues, none of them focus on young women. And this is a huge problem, not only in my community, but at the decision-making level, as we've seen previously. Mm, recently, I've read a fact that really impressed me, and it is that in the sixth IPPC report, only 34% of the others were women, and women represent half the population, so we need their voices. So the solution I'm working on is an academy for girls and young women that shows how from technology we can contribute uh, to sustainability. In this academy, girls have the opportunity to work with female professionals on different fields, for example, and in electronics, so they can use sensors, for example, in soil moisture and temperature, learn biology with a bioremediation approach, building websites to spread climate change knowledge, etc. And on the other hand, I'm working with Technovation, which is in the development of an app of species conservation and mapping, uh, retrieving data from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Thanks. And Winnie, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and what you're working on right now and um, some of the solutions that you're developing to address climate change in your community? Yes. Um, thank you, Kate. So uh, my name is Winnie Msamba and I am from Tanzania. I'm currently tuning in from Kenya. So um, the problem that I'm working on is on the extraction of a new soil substitute, um, mainly to combat um, the fight against the severe impact um, that soil facility is facing through climate change. So um, some of the solution that I have developed currently is the uh, manufacturing of an eco-friendly 100% um, organic growing medium from coconut husk, um, which is usually regarded as a biodegradable organic waste. So we use them and we extract to an organic growing medium for agricultural production. And um, so this really, I've been working with um, local farmers um, where we help them to use this um, effective medium to grow their plants um, at the same time to achieve the optimum outcome um, also to help them like keeping the environment safe and minimizing um, soil degradation. That's awesome. You both are doing such great work um, with technovation and, and your own rights. Um, so um, the next question is um, for both of you. So climate change is one of the big problems that we're tackling right now. And it's clear that young people like yourself are going to drive innovation and change. But today, less than 25% of climate organizations are founded or led by women and even fewer um, that use technology. So can you tell us uh, what would help get more young girls and women um, like you in your countries excited to launch a climate business of their own? Um, Winnie, do you wanna start off? Oh yes, definitely. So um, firstly, I think there's a need to demystify um, the term um, climate action so that uh, most girls can be able to be confident in, in tackling these issues. Because now, um, especially in Tanzania where I grew up, um, climate action is being looked at as something only like policymakers or people within the government um, that can only take a part of because there are very few um, role models around. So um, definitely that should be the first step. The second one should be um, creating of um, new spaces. And I believe there's a very clear line between um, creating a space that um, a normal business can strive, a normal business that is for, for, for profit, and um, for a space where a business that runs at the same time um, 
for profit, but at the same time creating the goal of reducing environmental impact. So we should create these programs um, while offering um, mentorship and financial support um, so that um, these a lot of these young um, girls can be encouraged to continue working on these issues, which I think for them um, also it's about inviting them and make them part of the conversation like what you're doing right now, which I think is one of the most um, crucial aspects. So maybe um, Giovanna can also take it through. Yeah, sure. Well, I also believe that in the power of women networks, because in these spaces, young women can find like-minded people that can mentor them in the development or launching of their businesses. And also in these spaces, women feel secure to share experiences, to fail and to grow together when starting these businesses. Also, I believe that having more women role models related to climate action is really important. And in my case, this was fundamental. I've always admired Julieta Martinez, a climate activist from Chile that stands for Girls Education as a Climate Solution. So um, by seeing their, her trajectory and what all she has done in Chile, I was inspired to do something similar in my country. And finally, I think that overcoming the misunderstanding of what climate action means is also crucial because it's not just attending marches or cleaning public spaces, which is also valuable, but climate action can be exercised from anyone and by uh, from any area of knowledge. For example, there's art with sustainable approaches, STEM solutions, biomimicry innovations, etc. And this also counts as climate action. Yeah, I love that. And on that point, Giovanna, um, um, talking about changing the perception of what climate action actually means. Um, so if you had a magic wand and could run a media or marketing campaign in your country encouraging girls to tackle uh, climate change um, through technology and entrepreneurship, what would that campaign look like? Um, yeah, so what if you could build it, what would you do to let girls know what they are capable of and how they could solve these problems on their own? Well, what comes to my mind is to create a hashtag, I don't know, like climate uh, tech by girls, so that women and girls are encouraged to show off their work through social media, uh, including research related to climate change or tech-based solutions. And after this, we can take all of these ideas or projects that are being done by women and create, I don't know, a virtual reality experience. <laughs> of a future, an optimistic future meta world where all of these solutions are being implemented as mitigation and adaptation tools in the face of climate change. Um, also, we can create, I don't know, AR filters. So you can take photos with these role models in ecopreneurship to inspire more girls and also highlight what these remarkable women are doing. For sure. Um... And this last question is for Winnie. Um, so you've actually launched your own successful climate business. What is your advice for young women entrepreneurs who are looking to get financial support? Oh, uh, I love this question. And um, allow me to quote uh, Sir Edward Deming. Um, he said, um, in God we trust, um, all others must bring data. And I think uh, what this really means is um, to start working and improving even before acquiring the financial support. So um, you don't wait for that one big financial support to start your work. Um, there are very few people currently in the world that will be, they would want to invest in ideas. So um, the first thing you should do like to utilize the network that you have. So we can start by asking for help. Um, maybe let's say you have some business people in your cycle, um, you can ask them to review your business plan. Anything really that will help you to start um, the business, you start from there. Um, it's easy to ask for um, financial support when you have data and evidence um, for the pilot that you have done or the research that you have done in calculating risk and like finding the hidden opportunities. I think as a young entrepreneur, it shows um, commitment. And also from there, you'll be able to sell your business to anyone at any time. So you go, you're going to be aggressive as you can be. You learn, you unlearn, and you always ask for feedback. That's really great advice, and it actually leads um, into our next push, our next um, section about financial models um, really well. So um, I know we are just getting to the 
be, we're just beginning to talk about all of these issues, but we are, you know, running out of time since we have such a tight schedule. So I wanted to thank you both, Winnie and Giovanna, for joining us today. Winnie, you'll be back um, for a little bit more, um, but you both are such great role models, and we're so very proud of you and the work that you're both doing. So thank you, and I'll pass it back over to Bryant to lead us into the next section. Thanks, thank Kate. Giovanna, thank you so much. Winnie, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, being a part of these coming conversations. Uh, it, it's clear to see why it's such a focus and, and priority for Technovation to, to put resources back into our alumni community because the amazing work and, and leadership that, that you two you know, are demonstrating. So thank you both. Um, so moving to our next conversation with Winnie, uh, I'd also like to introduce and bring in Samantha Quist. Samantha is a startup partnerships lead at Stripe, where she works with venture capitalists and startup communities to create delightful experiences for their portfolio of companies. Uh, I also just want to mention previously, uh, uh, once upon a time, Samantha was also a senior director at Techtivation. Uh, this conversation is on innovative financing models, young women investing in young women. So Samantha and Winnie, uh, have fun and take it away. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, thank you so much, um, Samantha, for joining us. So um, I'm just going to dive right into it. So um, we know that around the world, uh, there are very few um, women um, entrepreneurs, um, few women who start um, technological best businesses, and even few women investors. So um, there are very few hub um, for entrepreneurs around the world, uh, but they really do not overlap with the regions where women need the most support and have the least economic, economic opportunities. So what I would love to brainstorm with you today, Samantha, and kind of have a conversation is how we can create a global platform um, where women investors can invest um, or support um, these young women entrepreneurs and tech innovators, um, and especially for those who are really not from places, let's say like Silicon Valley um, or London. Uh, I'm talking for uh, uh, young entrepreneurs um, who are from the place, for example, like me, um, I'm a tech innovation alumni, and I started my business that I've talked about um, to fight against the severe uh, impacts that soil facilities facing to climate change. And um, so I know uh, Technovation has a very big strategic goal to support over 25 million young girls and young women over the next 15 years uh, to help them launch um, high impact initiatives and businesses. So with that scale in mind, um, the Technovation Alumni Network themselves uh, can be a very powerful source of funding. So here's an experiment to just think about. So um, I was thinking, what if we had about 25,000 Technovation Alumni around the world um, with innovative tech best startups, ideas, and working prototype? And they'll need at least say about 10,000 to 20, in seed funding to get started. Um, that's about roughly 200 to 500 million. Uh, as we know, the innovation goal is to have an alumni community that's about 25 million strong. Woohoo! Um, what if each alumni invested at least $25, then maybe miraculously everyone would be funded. Um, that's, I know that's a very dream scenario, but I'm sure it can happen. But I'm curious to hear from you now, Samantha, what do you think about this idea? Like, how can we build something like this to help and support these young innovators? Great. Um, well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And Winnie, it's a pleasure to meet you and, and hear from you about your experience. I think your, your advice about um, showing action and showing data was spot on and, um, and uh, excited about the potential of your business, as well as all of the technovation businesses that are, that are being developed. Um, so first of all, I want to say what an exciting idea <laughs> that you just asked me about. And um, I think that there are a number of sort of tailwinds that can sort of help push an idea like that towards you know fruition and success and um, really making a huge difference. One of them, um, you know, uh, I think there are there's a lot of money in the tech industry. <laughs> Women who work in the tech industry, that's whether it's tech innovation alumni, supporters, mentors, and so on. Um, you know, there are there is access to funds in the industry, and so um, 
I think, you know, one, one tailwind is that uh, the funds are there, people care about gender imbalance, like it's, it's, you know, um, a relevant issue for a lot of people who work in tech and people who work in tech really do want to make a difference. You know, if you look at some of the big tech companies, um, you know, I, I don't know if I would have worked at Google if it was like just a search engine, but the idea that it's organizing the world's information and like, <laughs> um, or, you know, at Stripe, uh, we're increasing the GDP of the internet and there's initiatives around Stripe climate and so on. So I think that people who work in tech want to make a difference in the world. And so um, I think there's motivation. A second sort of real tailwind, I think, is that investors um, have a herd mentality. Uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are notorious for this, that they talk about their investments and they talk to each other and they share, you know, what they're working on. And I think that that would really work in favor for an idea like this, that someone who makes an investment in a girl halfway around the world um, would be motivated to tell their friends about it and, uh, you know, really try to build traction for that, that girl and her business idea. Um, and then the third thing I think is just Tech innovation is uniquely positioned with the momentum that that has been built up over the past years and the network um, and the access to interesting entrepreneurs. I think there's um, sort of a huge potential for tech innovation where there might not be for other organizations. Uh, it, yesterday, I was in an event and ran by um, someone the idea of like, what if there were a way to invest you know, a small amount of money in businesses, you know, around the world. And the very first concern they brought up is but you never know like whether you can really trust the person who's taking them, who's really getting your money in the end. And in this type of scenario and idea, you would really know, you know, who is the, the uh, founder and what are they working on? And because it would be all vetted through tech innovation, I think that could be um, tremendous potential. I think there's some, some headwinds as, as well. Um, you know, number one, I don't think you can ever count on everyone in a network <laughs> contributing. Um, but, you know, even if, if it started a little bit smaller and not everyone contributed, or maybe there were, would be a few donors that would make a, a larger, con or investors that would make a larger contribution up front. Um, I think there could still be huge potential to, to, to make a big difference. I think a second challenge might be um, legal and logistical. I know in the U.S. it's relatively easy to start a business. I'm not sure what your experience is like, but I know in some other countries it can be um, a little bit challenging. But, you know, some of the, the most high impact ideas come from areas where there have been regulatory challenges. And so uh, if it's possible to overcome that, I think if anyone can do it, Technovation can and, and uh, figure out how to make that possible for the founders in the end. Great. Yeah, I, I, I truly, truly, truly believe that. So what do, what do you say about, like, how could we miss these accelerators to help and support these young innovators? What could we do? What should we do? Yeah, to, to what did you say? To message it? What, um, uh, what would be uh, your advice on what we should do due to immerse uh, these accelerators that um, probably they're there or the new one that should, they should probably come so they can really um, work as a bridge to help and support all these young innovators? Yeah, that's interesting. So I think that, um, you know, uh, for the accelerator, um, it, I think, you know, providing that type of community and that feel of a team that makes it possible for both the investors who feel like they're in it together and investing as a team in those um, entrepreneurs, as well as in the entrepreneurs themselves, you know, Technovation already has a track record of, of building teams and, um, you know, providing opportunities for people, for uh, recipients to share guidance with each other and, um, you know, build momentum from each other's successes, uh, I think, you know, would be hugely empowering as part of the platform in order to, you know, provide funding and make uh, financing more accessible. Great, great. And just some few last more questions. So what would be your advice for young women like me and those one who will be watching us about entrepreneurship and investing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think the number one thing is to uh, not give up easily. <laughs> I think that there are a lot of challenges that you hit along the way. And, uh, you know, no one will tell you when you're working on a new business, whether you're doing things right or not. Um, it might take a lot of tries. Like you might do things wrong a lot of times before you figure out the right model that is able to be sustainable and like truly helps people. Um, 
And uh, so I think my number one piece of advice would be to just not give up easily. I think and something else that was said earlier today about really paying attention to your user's need and being able to speak their language. And um, I thought was spot on as well that, you know, in the theme of not giving up easily, I think uh, I've made the mistake in the past when I was an entrepreneur of taking advice from, you know, anyone who would give me advice, let's hear it. And I would say one piece of advice is to not take advice from just anyone and really focus in on the people who matter, whether it's your, your, you know, the people who are using your technology and your, your app, um, or if you're going for financing, maybe it's the people who would potentially fund you. Um, but if it's not one of those, those key stakeholders, then, you know, maybe they're not, their perspective isn't going to be, you know, in the, the right direction to be able to provide you with the guidance that you need to push things forward. I absolutely agree. Thank you so much, Samantha. Just uh, before we wrap up, if you have any questions for me, uh, for the sake of all the other young girls who will be watching this. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear a little bit more about, about your um, experience and and you know what challenges you hit when you were you know working on financing and how you overcame them. Mm, that's a good question. I think um, mostly uh, there's always um, as as a young woman in business, uh, of course there are a lot of challenges that are always there. Uh, but I think most of most of uh, it's that I can say that I personally had gone through was to kind of have to prove yourself all the time that you're actually worth, um, you know, to, to what you are worth to be in the table because you have to, you, sometimes you think you have to work extra hard to just to be heard. And it's something definitely that I, I had to fight and sometimes bring my own chairs to the rooms full of people where um, you find um, they don't necessarily um, have um, kind of like a space for you. So kind of like being resilient and kind of pushing, pushing so hard to be heard, even if they're not listening. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Yeah. That makes sense. Excellent. Well, thank you well, so yeah. much. Yeah, it seems like- Yeah, you, I, I think I'll-, I'll so Congrats. Thank you so much. I'll give it back to Brian. Excellent. Over to you. Thanks, Winnie. Thank you. Great. Thank you both uh, for the conversation. Um, and with that, we can move forward to our, our final chat of our event. Uh, Winnie's gonna take part in what we're calling a fireside chat on the road to transforming climate tech entrepreneurship. Um, Kate, I don't know if you were gonna put up the slide, but maybe that's not needed. Uh, but joining Winning on this conversation, we have Megan English from the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Um, Megan is with the Office of the President at the McGovern Foundation. Uh, the McGovern Foundation has been such an important supporter of tech innovation, especially in our ability and the work we do to reach our alumni. So Megan, thank you for being here and excited to hear uh, the two of yours conversation. Megan, I'll, I'll start with you. I, I know you maybe had some intro comments and to, to transition into the conversation with Winnie. Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. And Winnie, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, you know, maybe to frame the conversation, together we face just such incredibly difficult intersectional challenges, many of which we've already spoken to today about the climate crisis and how it has already and will continue to disproportionately affect women and girls, particularly those living in conditions of poverty. Um, I think some of the facts that I, I'd want to highlight that we've already heard today were, you know, women participate in 50 to 80% of the world's food production, yet own less than 10% of the land. Um, and 70% of the 1.3 billion women, or excuse me, billion people living in conditions of poverty are women. So we recognize we have these very challenging and urgent situations, but we're finding we also have reasons for hope. Mm. Um, we have this unprecedented technology to help combat some of these urgent challenges, but most importantly, and I think most powerfully, we have this unstoppable force in the form of talent, passion, and innovation that young women like you, Winnie, can bring to addressing these shared challenges. So um, that's really why I'm so excited to speak with you today, Winnie, because as we've already heard today, you're already challenging and changing the lives and systems and norms um, that we, we're all experiencing today. So with that, maybe I can dive into a couple questions we prepared for you. Excellent. Great, that's a great. Awesome. Um, 
So there are so many of your accomplishments we've listed today, we've heard about, um, and that I could continue to list, but maybe I'll flip the question to you and ask you, what are you most proud of? Oh, that's a very brilliant question. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I think um, I think what I'm most proud of is that um, I saw a problem, um, like I said, of like a soil degradation, but I think I also, I also saw it in the lens of, of an opportunity. Um, where to solve that issue at the same time, like providing job opportunities um, to my fellow young people. So I'm very proud that um, I was able to do that and open an industrial scale facility, which has managed to um, create more jobs opportunities and involve like a lot of local farmers to switch to more sustainable means of production and, and also just start the conversation, like, like what I was talking to Samantha about, yeah. I love that. Um... You know, and maybe to, to come to the business piece, so far you've, mm -hmm. um, with your, your efforts, have led to the manufacture and sale of over 50 tons of cocoa peat. Um, yes. That's huge. <laughs> um, what do you think the next couple of years look like for your business? Ooh, um, I... I think it's gonna look like um, moving on um, outside Tanzania and kind of share um, this innovation to other countries, uh, potentially within East Africa. So we're talking about Kenya um, and Uganda. Um, I absolutely love to work um, also. Um, I think uh, I was taking some notes down here and, and with uh, what Jeff was talking about, land PSK. I absolutely love their innovation. Probably um, I would reach out to them too and see how we can work together on, um, you know, making sure that this innovation reach more people as possible and more people can be involved. Excellent. Um, that's what these conversations are for, right? Start to build yeah. those networks. Um, coming back to entrepreneurship, um, I'm curious, you know, having been an entrepreneur and, and continuing to be an entrepreneur, what do you think are the biggest barriers that young women face, particularly in Tanzania and Nigeria, but even as you continue to scale to other countries in East Africa? So um, apart from um, all the challenges that almost every um, entrepreneur has to go through um, to establish to grow business, um, young women are faced with an extra hurdle of like changing the narrative as uh, that they are less likely to succeed because let's say maybe they're not aggressive as men or are less likely to manage a startup. So because of this, um, there are less financial opportunity and support due to high risk in court of running a startup run by a woman, uh, which for me, I think it's a very psychological challenge um, that I can say it's almost um, institutionalized. So I also see it in the lens of an opportunity too, because there are less women in the ecosystem, which means we, we can get more women to join the board. I love it. Um, maybe one more question just around how you navigated that, thinking about, you know, were there mentors, were there specific folks that you looked to, um, to help you in that process? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I've had um I've had a share of um a lot of um powerful, strong women that I've, I've looked up to, especially when it's come to businesses um, back in Tanzania. Um Caroline Karizima has been one of the women I really look up to because she does not only challenge the status quo, but she also helped uh, young women like me, which has also um, inspired me um, in, in the lens of my work to not only think about um, the business, but also um, the the young women that are behind me or the young women who also need kind of like someone to look up to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so you had given Samantha a dream scenario. So I might give you one as well, if that works. <laughs> yeah. um, so we know that entrepreneurship plays an incredible, incredibly important role in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, about 42% of the workforce is either self-employed or is an employer, um, which is the highest rate in the world. Uh, women are more likely to be entrepreneurs than men, um, yet their businesses only earn about two thirds of the profits of their male owned counterparts, often because they are occupying crowded and low growth fields, most often outside of tech. So if we really wanted to move the needle on some of these issues, we'd really need to start to recruit and inspire and train women, young women particularly, into tech-based businesses and inspire them to launch tech-based businesses. So here's the dream scenario. Um, there's about 32 million adolescent girls just across Nigeria and Tanzania alone. Let's optimistically assume a third of them want to start a climate tech business. It's about 10 and a half million girls. So what would you do if you were in charge? 
how would you inspire and bring along these 10 and a half million girls, this incredible force to make some progress on the climate tech space? That's a very huge question. <laughs> <laughs> a dream scenario. <laughs> it is, it is, uh, definitely. Um, 10 million young girls. Um, I think as cliche as it, it's, it may sound, but I think it's absolutely important. Um, it's first by creating that awareness on mm -hmm. how big of the problem and climate change is and how important it is for everybody to be involved. I think that is absolutely important. And I know we have um, shared today all about um, creating spaces uh, where women will be able to learn, but what kind of spaces? Um, if, I, if I talk about on the specifics, um, in Tanzania, we have... Um, this thing called Vicoba, which is village community banking. Um, it's very conservative, but um, what if we revamp this with programs to fit the youth demographic? So we include tech for easy um, accessibility, um, where um, these young entrepreneurs can assess loans um, with manageable interest rates um, to support the businesses. I think that will be absolutely amazing. And I think the last thing I would say, um, we have a lot of programs um, in Tanzania. Um, um, let's meet talk about Wasafi Media. It's a very youth-centered media where it has a lot, millions of um, young followers. So what if we do work hard to create these educational programs that we showcase innovations where young people can learn from? Maybe, maybe <laughs> uh, we're talking about um, five years, 10 years along the line, we might have 10 even more uh, millions of young girls being um, impacted and inspired. So I, I kind of, uh, because it's such, it's such a massive question, Megan, I kind of want to put the question back to you. Uh, so how would you do about inspiring uh, and train, training 10 young women to become climate tech entrepreneurs? Yeah. It is a huge question. Um, I loved what you said earlier about demystifying climate action. What does that term mean? Um, and I also think creating those new space off spaces offering mentorship and financial support um, are incredibly important. Um, so, so much of what you shared already has resonated with me. I think um, what I'd highlight are just a few approaches um, that different actors can take. Um, you know, first, I think it's imperative that we build and build that strong support network of mentors and teachers, champions for young women as they explore the tech and climate space. Um, you know, perhaps in those those spaces that you identified. Um, you know, I think it's critical to not only just identify this this support system and network, but ensure that those mentors and teachers and curriculums have the resources that they need to support um, the women and girls that are coming through their programs, um, especially through adolescents, students, adolescents, we know girls' confidence and interest in STEM often drops off uh, during adolescence. So absolutely critically important. Um, I think that's where the social sector and philanthropy can help, um, you know, supplementing the support of the scale of these successful programs and initiatives worldwide. I think philanthropy also has a role to play in bringing different sectors together um, so what does that mean? You know, governments, ensuring that governments are supporting, um, implementing strong curriculums for young girls, quality education. Um, and we know it's in their economic interest in the long term to do so. Um, thinking about the private sector, who also has a huge role to play. You know, we've recently seen a significant shift in workers coming from big tech companies moving into that climate tech space. I think making, and, and often, you know, especially this week, climate week, hearing a lot of big bigger uh, private companies taking on larger climate commitments. I think to continue to create climate facing opportunities for young women and girls to get involved, um, make sure that those opportunities are available around the world and that they're supportive and done in partnership with the communities in which they're working are, is incredibly important. Um, but really I think the, the most important piece is just demonstrating what's possible. And that's what, you know, and what's possible now and what is possible in the future. What is beyond possible is not impossible. Um, and celebrating those who are leading the work like yourself um, and just creating clear pathways for others to follow and join you in this work. Um, so to answer your question, in short, I think um, if I were in charge, I think I'd put you in charge. <laughs> is my answer. <laughs> yes, just put all the young girls in chat. That's the exactly. best answer. <laughs> oh, well, that's Excellent. good. Dude. Thank, you so, thank you so much, Megan, for having me. Um, um, this has been a very thoughtful um, um, conversation, and I am absolutely, I'm sad that climate switch 
is coming um, to an end, but I'm absolutely glad um, that we've had a lot of young people today to be uh, part of the conversation. And I believe this won't be the last day. Uh, these conversations are going to continue. And I'm very excited to see um, where to next we're gonna ha be headed. So uh, thank you so much, Megan. Absolutely agree, Winnie, thank you. And um, here's to hoping a lot of action comes out of these conversations this week. Brian, maybe back to you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Winnie. Megan, I, I definitely give a thumbs up. I support um, the initiative to put Winnie in charge. And Winnie, I support your, your, first, your first action in making all uh, young women in charge. So, so totally on board. <laughs> um, thank you um, to all of our speakers. Just so much great insight and conversation packed into an hour. It's just incredible that this community we have here and just Grateful we got to share it with our community and to everyone uh, watching. Um, climate solutions, you know, as you can see, are at the forefront of the work that Technovation Girls are doing, that so many around the world are working on. Um, I did just want to end by, by mentioning that Technovation Girls registration actually opens up on October 11th. Um, for those of you that are kind of new and learning about Technovation, uh, you've heard about the Technovation Girls it is a 12 week program run as a competition that girls all around the world, that's open to all girls around the world, ages eight to 18 to take part in. Girls work in a team to build um, a project that solves a local issue, especially uh, focused on climate issues. Um, so my call to action is to learn more about Techivation, consider getting involved, whether you're a mentor, each team works with at least one mentor, um, sometimes more, um, or if you have girls in your community that you think this might be the program for, um, you know, check out techivationchallenge.org where you can register October 11th, uh, get girls involved, be involved as a mentor, bring it to an educator, um, reach out to Techivation if you have any questions. Thank you so much again to all of our speakers. And thank you for this great event.